Syzygy episode 32, a mysterious box of asteroid stuff. Well, we're back again for another episode of the Syzygy podcast. This is episode 32, and joining me on the microphone, as ever, opposite me at the table here in her office is Dr. Emily Brunston. Hi, Emily. Hello, hello. Today, we're going to be talking about landing on lumps of rock. And this has happened a bit over the last couple of decades, that that humans stepping off the bounds of this Earth, even if it's just robotically, sending spacecraft up, getting close to lumps of rock. Sometimes they're very big lumps of rock, like... Like Mars, that's quite a big lump of it's rock. A rather large and we've one. managed to sort of put things down and drive around on Mars, and we're still doing that now. But increasingly, we seem to be sending missions out to much smaller lumps of rock, like, like comets, or in this case, an asteroid. The Japanese space agency, JAXA, um, has managed to actually land. On an asteroid, is that right? Well, not quite land. Well, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, so we've got, we'll get into the details. Some bits of have that. landed, some bits are bouncing. They've shot. They've shot an asteroid, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Shot an asteroid. That's yeah. kind of cool. So we'll be talking about that today, which is a, a lot of fun. Learning about you know what this thing's made up of, and uh, and uh, well, I mean, answering the question, why are we doing this? But before we get to that, we've had a question. I had a question from out there in listener land. Listener Steve has sent in a question on the Twitter that has said. Uh, And Emily, with any luck, you'll be able to answer this one, said, look, you guys are always going on about Tess. And I'm paraphrasing here, Steve, if I'm getting your words wrong. You guys are always going on and on and on about Tess. And a little while ago on the podcast, we talked about the fact that Tess has been doing some of its initial scientific observing uh, runs and downloading the, the data. And Emily and lots of other astronomers are sifting through it going, awesome, let's see what we can find. But we mentioned that the um the Tess's cameras observe a part of the sky for 27 days at a time. And Steve said, why 27 days? Is that like, that's a, a strangely specific number. Why 27? Is there is there a reason to that? And the only thing that I could come up with was from when I used to do yoga and my yoga teacher, when we when he used to instruct us to do our yogic breathing and we would have to breathe and count our breaths down from 27. And I asked him one day, why are we counting down from 27? And he said, because it's a quarter of 108. And I didn't really have a response to that. So looking for a better answer than 27 is a quarter of 108. Emily, why does Tess observe for 27 days at a time? Well, yeah, no, 108 does not feature in no? Tess's okay. uh, right. calculations here. Well, what actually Tess is, is it's got some wonderful orbit. And this orbit is stabilised by the presence of the moon. So Tess is much, much closer than we, we know. Kepler was uh, in an Earth trailing orbit. Tess, we wanted to keep nice and close and talk to it quite regularly. Right. So this is what happens. It goes around in an orbit which is resonant with the moon. Now, the moon has an orbital period of 27 days, uh, sorry, 29 days. Um, and what we've done with Tess is kind of put it inside that orbit in a quite an eccentric way, such that it actually orbits the Earth twice in that kind of period. So it goes around about every 15 uh, days, will be a bit shorter than that. Right. Um, and so each time Tess goes around, it's doing its um, observation. So one observation cycle takes twice uh, Tess's orbit. And we get a major download period uh, in that uh, 27 days as well, or just after the 27 days of observation finishes. And that coincides when Tess is closest to the Earth. So we get the best signal. Makes sense. From it. So it's all to do with the moon, and it's balancing Tess's orbit really, really nicely. The 27 days, and then we've got a couple to kind of um, help us with downloads, and um, Tess really focuses on you know spending all its energy transmitting that data back to us during that time. Right. When the question came up, I did wonder, it, it, it's too much of a coincidence for that not to be related to the moon. 27 days, 28 days, 29 days. It's got to be in there somewhere, but it wasn't quite on the, yeah. the lunar orbit number of days. So that kind of makes sense. You got, you got, what did you say, twice around and then a couple of days, twice around of a 15-day orbit yeah. and then a couple of days for downloading and bookkeeping and making sure everything's polished and okay. Yeah, yeah, and it might be plus or minus a few hours depending right. on the exact orbit and the sector and so right. on for that. So there well. you go. Yes, yeah. there is a reason why it's 27 days and the reason is the moon. There we are. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. So moving on to the uh, the main story du jour. Um, Emily, 
we're landing things, and by we, I'm talking the world, humanity at large, because this has been the uh, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, as they're known, um, have been going up and having a look at an asteroid. Take us through this one. First of all, where, where do we find out about this news? So, well, this came out on the 21st of Feb, so mm-hmm. just about a week ago. And why it's super big news is because we've been able to do the first sample collection from this asteroid. Ah, okay. So this isn't just visiting it and waving. This is actually grabbing a bit of the asteroid and going, what's this? What's it made of? Yeah, although the spacecraft itself is not making that judgment. Right. Because this is, even more excitingly, a sample return mission. It's coming back. It's coming all the way back oh, to Earth. wow. Okay. So that's, that's non-trivial. You know, no. sending something up to, to intercept a lump of rock in space is one thing. And well done. Because when I was reading this story, I was thinking, like, this isn't big. This isn't a really big lump of rock. This is actually quite a small lump of rock, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the the lump of rock, should we give it a, a, its proper name? Go on then. It's Ryugu. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's an asteroid that's about a kilometre across. And instead of kind of looking a bit more potato-y, like a lot of asteroids look like, they're kind of a bit lumpy and a bit irregular, this one's quite an interesting sort of shape. It's kind of like a bit like a diamond shape, but rounded off and sort of smoothed on the corners. It's a rounded off smooth diamond, but sure. Yeah, but it's, but it's a kilometre. I mean, that's... This space is big. We've come across this idea before. And, and a kilometre-sized lump of rock, sure, that'd, that'd hurt if you hit you. But it's pretty small in the grand scheme of things in space. So, so why this one? So this one was chosen by JAXA to send their second uh, asteroid return sampler. So the the mission itself is called um, Hayabusa, Hayabusa 2, in fact, because they had one already. Because it's the second one. Yep, Yep. second one, yep. Um, And this particular asteroid was chosen very specifically because it's quite a special one. Mm -hmm. It's um, what we call, it's called a C-type, but it's probably actually a CG type of asteroid all right so let's start this one at a time what's the c so the c stands for carbon or um, carbonaceous okay say that one carboniferous no um anyway carbon it's got carbon in it yep um, but it's also supposed to have, well, it's got some of the spectral properties. So it's got some interesting uh, spectral lines, which also suggest it might be G-type, which is um, a bit more like, oh, our best example would be the uh, Ceres, one of the biggest asteroids, actually, oh, okay. in the asteroid belt. It's a big sphere. We've gone to Ceres before with um, missions to photograph it. Right. So does the G stand for anything? Like C, C for carbon, G for... Uh, no, it just means that it's rare, basically. Okay. So right. the CG type is one of the most rare types of asteroids. And we can you know, categorize all these asteroids into different boxes, put them in different boxes based on what their properties are from when we observe them on Earth. But it'd be really quite good if we could get stuck in there and bring some of that asteroid back and really get that sample uh, studied better so we actually get those categories understood a bit better as well. Okay, so can we just just nail down, though, what are we talking about here? Because Ceres is a a large asteroid, but correct me if I'm wrong, it's in the asteroid belt? It's out in the asteroid belt, right? Which is is a, a whole bunch of bits of rock, tiny up to really quite large, between Mars and Jupiter, right? Um, And that's quite a long way away. But that's not where where this one is. No. The JAXA hasn't gone out past Mars and half the way to Jupiter in order to do this. So this isn't part of the asteroid belt. So where are we in space? Uh, so we're a bit closer to home. So we mm-hmm. found an asteroid that was a little bit easier to get to. Uh, this one, it's got a really interesting orbit. It actually has a, um, a not a circular orbit like the Earth or Mars has. So it doesn't sit in between each of those planets. It's actually got an elliptical orbit which means sometimes it comes inside the orbit of the Earth, so closer to the sun than the Earth. And then at other times, it's quite a lot further away. So if we call our distance between us and the sun one, then the asteroid moves between 0.96, so just inside of us, all the way out to 1.4. Okay, so that's that's halfway out again, or almost almost halfway out again as the Earth from the from the Sun. So that's quite a what's what's known as an eccentric orbit. It's it's stretched, whereas the Earth's orbit is fairly circular. Um this is this is fairly eccentric, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But that means that it comes quite close to the mm. Earth's orbit from time to time, which makes it kind of easier to send a space probe to. Right. And that's why it's called a correct me if I'm wrong, a near Earth asteroid. Indeed. Right. Yes. Because it yeah. comes near to Earth. Kind of makes sense. N E A. Yeah. So it was chosen because it does come close to us, so it's easier to get to, at least some of the time, Um, but also chosen because it's 
an interesting kind of asteroid. It's not just some common or garden variety lump of rock floating through space. It's got some interesting stuff that are, that's worth exploring. So take us through that. Why? Well, we've got some big questions about things that happened in our solar system in its early days. We like days. big questions big on questions. this podcast. Okay. Big, big questions that are really relevant to the Earth as mm-hmm. well. So we know that all the water that's on the surface of the Earth didn't come originally from the Earth. Right. It didn't come in the original package. It arrived later on, which blows my mind because you kind of think of the Earth as sort of, well, you know, it, it came as a package. This is this is how it's been forever. But it wasn't. We got bombarded by all sorts of stuff back in the early days. And the water, all the water, came from elsewhere. Yeah. So we have what we call a secondary atmosphere, which means that the original atmosphere that the Earth was born with was kind of blown away by the solar winds in the early part of the universe. So every bit of atmosphere we have now has come at a later time uh, from gases coming out of rocks or from sublimation of other materials on the surface of the Earth. So I, I, I feel like I'm very slowly putting this together, but I am, I am fairly dense sometimes, so just bear with me. Does that mean, like I'm assuming that, that all the other planets, like Mars and Venus and Mercury to, to greater or lesser extents, would all have a similar kind of story, except that the Earth just happens to be in a good position from the sun, whereby being bombarded by stuff from space, which has water and other stuff, Earth was able to hang on to it and turn it into oceans and atmosphere, as opposed to having it all boil away again or freeze or whatever it might do. Yeah, that's definitely true for the rocky planets. So us, um, Mercury, Venus and Mars. So we kind of in the right temperature zone, we had the right materials on the surface of the Earth to mean that we were able to build up this atmosphere. Because remember, Venus has a pretty big atmosphere Mm. as well. It's just made out of slightly different stuff. (laughs) It's not a very friendly atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, The Otherwise, if we had been further away from the sun and hadn't had all our primary atmosphere sort of blown away, then we'd have mostly hydrogen like uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and even the ice giants, they've got a lot of hydrogen um, in their atmospheres. So we lost so, all that. So Earth feels like a very, very special place. And in many ways it is, but there's nothing more special about the, the story of the, the, the composition of the Earth other than we're in a pretty good place. And we were able to hang on to that and turn it into this this crazy environment that we see around us, as opposed to runaway global warming that you've got on Venus or too close to the sun, boiling hot, rocky environment on Mercury or whatever. Yeah, Yeah. cool. Okay, so we're getting back to those big questions then. Questions about about our own environment here on Earth. What can we find out from this asteroid? Well, we still don't know where our water came from. Right. So we need to resolve this because we thought, okay, maybe later on in the evolution of the solar system that maybe lots of comets hit the Earth. Comets are kind of big snowballs and they've got lots and lots of water ice in them. So if you get lots of comets bombarding the Earth, then maybe they were the source of our water. Well, we went to a comet. and yeah, We talked about that recently, didn't we? So we had the Rosetta mission to a comet to try and look at this. And what was one of the questions Rosetta was asking was, is the water in this comet the same as the water that we have on Earth? Yeah, and that was an amazing mission because that really was, you know, you got the, the Rosetta spacecraft and then it sent down the the little Filet. lander, Philae, the lander. Yeah. And it was just this most amazing moment of, oh, my God, we've landed on a comet. It worked. Yeah, yeah. it was fantastic. Yeah, so that was very cool. But the answer was basically the water's different on that comet than on the surface of the Earth. Okay, take me through that again because I, I know we have talked about this, but just remind me and the listeners at home who may be as forgetful as I am, how can the water be different to so, the water here? Yeah, it's it's a bit complicated. It's a bit of it's the isotopes of water that are around and how much you have of each different type of isotopes. So there's a very subtle differences in the chemical properties of the water based on its configuration. And we can tell from that that you don't switch between these different isotopes. We're talking about as in water which is made with, with normal common or garden variety hydrogen versus water that has deuterium in it, water that has different kinds of hydrogen which have slightly different nuclear structure. And the proportions that we see here on Earth should match the proportions of those different isotopes that we would see somewhere like a comet if the water on Earth had come from comets. But you're saying we don't. Well, at least it wasn't like that comet. Not on this comet. And we don't have any good reason to believe that it was a particularly weird comet. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, one would assume that it would be a representative comet. Yeah. 
you hope. So so that suggests, well, maybe not comets or maybe not all comets anyway. Yeah. So let's think about what else might have hit the Earth in the mm-hmm. early parts of the solar system. What other chunks of rock are, are there out there in Ooh, space? Indeed. And so asteroids become come to mind. Now, asteroids don't look like they're very wet and they certainly don't have oceans running around on the surfaces. But there's quite a lot of water that's trapped into particular clays and minerals on the on asteroids. And so the next question is, well, is that the same as the water that we have here on Earth? Okay, so to answer that question, you've got to go and find yourself an asteroid. And then you've got to go and get some of it and bring it back home, which is exactly what this mission's trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So we could do this other ways, let's be honest. And there are d- severe disadvantages as to why we're not doing it those other ways, which is why we're All doing right, so how this else, way. So how else would you determine the composition of an asteroid without going there? So you could use asteroids that are on the surface of the Earth already. Oh, well, that's true. Yes. So you've got meteorites which fall from space onto Earth. Okay, that, hang on. Just a quick run through of the of the naming structure here. So a meteorite is a meteor that's actually reached the surface of the Earth. Yep, that's so it's the a chunk rock. of rock that's yep. left behind in the smouldering crater that's left behind as it's as it's landed. Um, a meteor is a chunk of rock that's hit the atmosphere. Is that yep. right? Yep. So it's blazing through the sky, which could be an asteroid, could in principle be a comet, but that'd be horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, we wouldn't want that. So basically, a meteor is an asteroid. Could be, or it could be a chunk of the moon. Oh. Or it could be a chunk of Mars. Do we do we often get chunks of the moon? <laughs> we, we, <laughs> Forgive my ignorance, but I would have thought we'd notice that. <laughs> Most of the ones we see today are asteroids, let's be fair. Right. But we have found meteorites on Earth that have come from the moon, that have come from Mars. So we do have bits of these other planets and moons wow. that scatter around on our surface as well. Space is weird, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't we, and what, wasn't there a chunk of, hang on, wasn't there a chunk of the Earth found on the moon? Oh, that's good. Back. I would imagine there probably is lots of the Earth on the moon. I'm going to have to look that up. If yeah. I, if I do find that story, I'm going to put it in the show notes because I may have just dreamt that. But I'm I'm fairly certain that one of the samples that was found on the moon was Earth rock. In yeah. which case, what? That's nuts. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So yes, now that we've gone through that, meteorites are meteors that hit the ground, and meteors are, let's call it asteroids, forgetting about the whole moon and Mars thing. So, ha, huh, asteroids. Right? Yes. We've gone and we've. What you were saying was that we could determine the composition of asteroids by finding the bits of them that are still here on the Earth that have actually landed here. Exactly, yeah. All right, well, that's, yeah, there's a few of those lying around. There's quite a few. Um, The problem is it's difficult to know from whence they came. True, yeah. It's a bit Uh, hard to work that one out. We can work out Mars and the Moon, but Mm -hmm. an asteroid, you can't pinpoint exactly which one it came from. Did it come from a C-type, a G-type, or something else? Okay. Um, It's also been modified by the fact that um, quite a lot of these samples are relatively small, so their outsides got superheated as they came in through our Earth's atmosphere. So a lot of stuff would have burnt off, gassed off, melted away. And then they got weathered on the surface of the Earth as they hung around waiting for us to find them. So, yeah, they, they're not pure samples. Right, right. So that's a difficult thing to do is to figure out, working backwards from that, reverse engineering it, what was the original asteroid like and could that help to explain where all the water and stuff came from on the Earth? Okay, so are there any other ways? Well, we could do what we do with Mars and that's send a, a rover or a lander onto the surface that has the ability to make these tests itself. Right, okay. So the, the Martian rovers are not, going to launch themselves back up into space and send stuff back to Earth. They've got to be a little bit more self-contained. And if they're going to look around on the surface, drill down into it, take some samples, then they need to have all of the scientific machinery on board to be able to actually analyse some of those samples. Reasonably rudimentary, but actually it's amazing how complicated you can get in a, in a Martian rover and a Martian lander. So, yeah, OK, we could do that. That's a bit tricky. It's a bit tricky. Um, it's... Landing on Mars is one thing. It's a fairly large lump of rock. You can you know, pretty easily find it and land on it these days. We've done that a few times now. Still not trivial, but easier to do. Landing on an asteroid, not so much? It's not so much the landing that's too difficult. We can, we can manage that it's for small objects. Um, it's a, a question of cost and effort as well. So you can only have a limited number of experiments that you can do on a rover that you've pre-planned. Uh, you don't have the luxury of just bobbing around in your lab and thinking, oh, I wonder what would happen if I tried this. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing. But yeah, the, the cost totally is a huge thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I would have thought that landing on something, I mean, landing on that comet proved to be 
I mean, I knew it was going to be challenging, but I remember when the, the, the what was it called, filet? Yeah. Um, when the little filet lander went down and it bounced around for a long time and, and ended up sort of, you know, partly hidden in a, in a little valley on the surface of the comet. Because when you've got a lump of rock, which is like still really quite large, but by astronomical standards, very small, and particularly from a gravitational point of view, like there's not a big force of gravity there. It's enough so that you can stick to it through the force of gravity, but you do tend to bounce around quite a lot. And so landing on something of that size is, is not an easy thing to do because you don't tend to stay landed <laughs> you tend to sort of float away really easily exactly yeah so actually what this mission is all about is not landing uh, an, an, an object or at least not landing the, the sampler onto the surface of the asteroid but kind of kicking down bouncing off the surface and during that bounce picking up um, debris off the surface of the asteroid yeah, collecting be... it and then going back into its normal orbit around the asteroid. Yeah, collecting stuff, but not not actually trying to sort of stick down on the surface. By basically colliding with it, and and grabbing some bits that are that are blown off in that process. So so where is it at? What's the what's the status of the mission? So we wanted to collect three samples during this mission, and this is the first one. And the way that they are being collected is really quite exciting. Okay. Because this is where you can think of the fact that actually maybe we're not so fond of this asteroid <laughs> after all, because we're shooting it. Oh, that seems a bit rough. It is a bit rough, but what we're trying to do is um, we're taking these um, little bullets. They actually could are called bullets. They're about five grams. And they're made of tantalum, which is a very strong material, and firing them incredibly, very, very high velocities into the surface. And what that does is it creates a big bush of particles that come up off the surface, and those are collected by a feed horn or a sampler horn. And uh, they're collected up into there, bottled up, put into a little capsule, and stored away. And then we're going to eventually bring all three samples, we hope, back to Earth. So they've got these these bullets made out of very strong materials. They're firing them at the surface and, and, and blowing up sort of a cloud of stuff off the surface. And then they've got a horn, sort of a, a, a spread out dish or horn shaped device for collecting to see what they can find. Yeah, so these bullets are being fired at a pretty astounding velocity. They're 300 metres per second. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's that's sort of, that's bullet speed on Earth, isn't it? Yeah, bullets, it's close yeah. to sound speed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, 670 miles an hour if you want to right. be. So that's going to hurt. That's yeah. going to hurt. So the poor asteroid. <laughs> that's a little bit like how, how, um, how marine biologists, you know, get tissue samples from whales and things like that, though, is they don't, they don't. They don't fire a bullet and then spray stuff up in the air and then collect it in a, in a big sort of horn-shaped container. But they, they fire something at a, at a whale um, and pull out a plug of tissue from the, from the skin of the whale and sort of rein it back in. So it's, you know, it's, it's the, it's the uh, astronomical equivalent of the ma- marine biology method of collecting samples. I think yeah. that, that works. Sounds less painful, though. Yeah, well. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so we're hoping to get three of these samples, um, and maybe up to 10 grams in each, but really they'll be happy with just a, a couple of grams, I think. Um, and, well, maybe even a few milli- hundreds of milligrams as, as, the, as the real goal. What's quite cool is that they've already found out quite a lot of new information about this asteroid just from this whole process of preparing for the first sample. So you said they wanted to do three, and this is the first of the three, but they're yeah. already getting some interesting results. What have they found? We launched this um, Hayabusa 2 in December 2014, so it took a while to get there. And we started approaching the asteroid in June last year. Mm-hmm. And we thought, okay, this is brilliant. We, we're getting some close-up images for the first time. Actually, those first images that were coming through were quite interesting in themselves. We were able to see this um, asteroid, and we were, about to, we were able to put some of those images together and see it stereoscopically, Ooh. which means we're able to see it in 3D. Very exciting. And he, here's a fun fact for you. Who do you think put together the stereoscopic images and made the 3D? I, I couldn't begin to guess. Quite a famous astronomer. Famous for a study on solar system science, zodiacal dust, plays a lot of guitar for a very big band. Oh, not 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 Brian May. And Brian May. Oh yeah. my god. From Queen. <laughs> 
Yeah, I yep. love it. Yeah. I didn't know he was still doing astronomical stuff. Yeah, he's he's always been really into the stereoscopic imaging, so it was really cool that I guess he got on board and uh, put together these images oh, to make wow. this asteroid really come to life. That's very cool. Yeah. I love it. Here we go. Uh, so that was nice. Um, and when we started to really map the surface of this um, asteroid, we were quite shocked, I think, to begin with, because we were expecting uh, to see kind of a, a dusty surface, small particles um, on the surface of this asteroid, and maybe some kind of big flat planes, maybe 100 metres across. That would be nice landing sites or sample sites. And it turns out that this asteroid is a bit weird, or at least it's definitely not what we were expecting. So it's it's not playing nice in terms of yeah, here's a, here's a nice big target area for you. So what what's it like? It's really big and it's rocky. It's got right. all these rocks and st- lumpy things strewn all over the surface of it. Is that because I mean, when you when you get something which is this size, what did we say it was about a kilometer across? Yeah. I mean, gravity is certainly not going to be strong enough to to sort of terraform it into a sphere by any stretch of the imagination so does that just mean that you end up with this sort of conglomeration of lumpy bits all stuck together but wouldn't be smoothed off they would just be sort of yeah lumps. or that it's been it's sort of broken up a little bit over its history right. so one of the ideas is that maybe this used to be a much bigger asteroid ah, and it's kind okay. of broken apart at some point right so you're seeing sort of the, the the craggy edge of where it used to be bigger but it's been smashed or hit by something or just broken apart for for whatever reason yeah so that made it quite difficult actually for the mission because they were expecting nice big smooth sites in which to um, be able to drop down fire in their bullets oh, yeah, pick that's up the right. stuff i was reading in the article that you that you sent me that they were sort of weren't they looking for like a hundred meter diameter area you know nice big target area that we could hit and they ended up revising that down somewhat down to something which was like six meters yeah, across. Yeah, the best they could find was six meters. <laughs> you can imagine them turning around to the engineering team and going, okay, you know that original plan we had for 100 meters? How do you think about six? Yeah. Okay, everyone get out your, your pens and your paper. Let's, let's work this one out. Can we do six? Apparently they can. They definitely are. So they needed a minimum of three and they did mm-hmm. very, very well. And Because uh, you can't predict exactly where it's going to bounce off the surface. So you need to have kind of a window of um, or an area which is going to be safe. And uh, yeah, they did incredibly well. And they basically landed right on target. Uh, for this mission. And that's why it was delayed by a couple of months. They intended to do this in December. They had to go back but and then do the thought, calculations oh, no. again. <laughs> we, need to, we need to check this. Yeah, so that was quite cool. Um, but it's not just all about the samples that are going to come back as well. We actually do have rovers already released onto the surface of this asteroid. Hang on, what? Really? Yeah, How? yeah. So this is where you might have to revise your definition of what actually is a rover. Right. And it's not really... Your, it's, not, it's your mental mental picture of what a rover is. Okay, so my mental picture of a rover is what we have on Mars, which are, you know, modest-sized buggies with wheels driving around, and they kind of look they look cute. They look like something out of a Pixar film. They look a bit like Wall-E. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, though no? these, these aren't like that at right. all. These what? are two rovers called 1A and 1B. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> they were launched off in September. Um, they are... Hang on, we've had... We've had Spirit, we've had opportunity, we've had curiosity, and we've now got one A and one, one B. Someone's not earning their salary, I think, on that <laughs> one. We need we need the scientific n- nomenclature team on this one, big time. Well, let me tell you what they are first, and okay. maybe you'll decide if they deserve better names. They are basically little cylindrical tubes, um, seven centimeters in diameter and eighteen centimeters high. They totally need names. Absolutely. I Look, we need to get onto this. Who do we need to write to? Come on. <laughs> JAXA, I suspect. All right. Yeah. Well, I think we, we need to start a campaign now, right? We'll On Twitter, we'll do it. They need names. Yep. So these little things are about a kilo each, and they basically just contain cameras and kind of like souped up GoPros, really, is what they've got on board. And uh, they bounce around on the surface. So they're not roving. They haven't got wheels in that sense. They're not rolling around because there's too many boulders and things like that. But because of the low gravity, they can just sort of bounce. Just wander around. Yeah, they can just... I mean, even if they had wheels, you'd hit a bump and you'd just go flying off anyway. So there'd be no point. Yeah. I can. You mentioned those little clicky beetles and things that just sort of like hop around on the surface. So are they just using their original sort of momentum... 
and the fact that they're now bouncing off things to just sort of wander their way around? Like, how do they? Well, they can. They can self. Well, right. So they, they do have a they bit of. They can propel themselves, but only a few times. Right. And uh, they don't have a lot of control over what direction they're often. I totally think these things need names. Okay, leave it with me. Leave yeah. it with me. We're going to start a campaign. <laughs> so they're really, really cute. Um, there was also a, a, another rover called Mascot, which was sent down to the surface. Uh, Is this all from the same mission? All from the same mission. Yeah. So it took them with it. Yeah. <sighs> Just sort of said, off you go now. I love You're it. You're on your way. These yeah. are like little insects running around on the surface. They are. Yeah. They are. And they're helping map it out. So that's how we were able to look at what actually is the size of these boulders. What is the surface like? Um, yeah. So coming back to MASCOT. MASCOT stands for Mobile Asteroid Surface Scout. Okay. So that was a, a bit more interesting. Um, and that one's uh, only had 16 hours of battery. So it wouldn't last as long as these other guys. But yeah, it was able to kick around on the surface again. And uh, it managed to flip itself, I think, and take some images and just see what it's like. I love this. This story has on taken on, on so many good new dimensions. That's it's fantastic. Good, it? It's really good. So yeah, so there's um, lots of other interesting things that are going on as well. But we've still got more to do. Uh, as we said, we've only done one of the samples. We're going to do another one of these, drop down, fire the small bullet into the asteroid and pick up another sample. See what comes off. Yeah. That's um, sometime in the next couple of months that's right. going to happen. But you said that was going to, there were going to be three samples. So the third one's different. The third one's different. Ah. You're going to really like this one because we thought if shooting it wasn't enough. <laughs> what else can we do? We need to get out some bigger weaponry. Okay. Because <laughs> this asteroid, you know. Oh. <laughs> I am beginning to feel sorry for this asteroid now. So what are they going to do? So in April this year, we're expecting to launch not a five gram uh, projectile, but a two and a half kilogram Ooh, projectile. Okay. That's something more significant. Yeah. it's yeah. Gonna, we're going to have to sort of stand back for this one. So that's either going to blow off a much larger amount of stuff or it's going to blow off an entire chunk of the thing. <laughs> What's the idea here? Well, the idea, let's, let's, moder- let's moderate that down a little bit. Okay. We're hoping to make a crater about two metres across. Okay. That's, I mean, that's pretty big. Yeah. So is the idea to try to get stuff which is deeper down inside? That exactly. you're not just wanting to get stuff yeah. off the surface, we want to know what's underneath. We want to know what's underneath. And the reason is because the surface of an asteroid is subject to space weathering. Right. You know, it has um, interactions from the solar wind, the particles, the sunlight that's heading on it. So we want to get underneath the surface and get some particles from deeper down that haven't been exposed to that kind of radiation and see what that's like as well. Excellent. We do so have to be that's... super careful, though, because yeah. otherwise, because we've got to make sure that the spacecraft is out of the way when we yes. you know, yeah, don't that want can, to be hit with that recoil <laughs> from, from the um, asteroid. But yeah. So yeah, April, we're hoping to, to do that, which wow. would be really, really hey, exciting. So, so quick question then. I've just been thinking about this as you've been talking, and I'm, I'm again, a bit slow on the uptake sometimes. So it's going to take these samples, and then it's going to turn around and it's going to come back to Earth. How does it get the samples back down onto Earth? Am so, I being stupid yeah, about this? No, no. How does it? How is it going to get back down onto the surface of Earth? Well, I mean, not, that's a really yeah, hard thing to do really for us, for a you know a space shuttle or a you know an Apollo mission or equivalent to do. How is this thing going to? Well, fortunately, we have done this bit before. Mm-hmm. In fact, we've done most of it before, just right. not in what we what we hoped the sort of quantity. So we sort of had a. The um, Hayabusa 1 mission did a similar thing, different type of asteroid, um, and got a little bit of stuff. It sort of half failed, and it had a lot of problems during the operation. Well, that's but, why you have more than one mission, right? You well, get all the mistakes out of the way, yeah, hopefully, early it, on. And... But it, it kind of had, had a moderate success as well. So it was able to get some samples from an asteroid. And this was the first time we'd done that. And it did return them to the Earth. So what we do is we pack them into a little capsule capsule and that capsule is about 40 centimeters across and it's super well shielded it's you know looked after um and then it's that little um capsule that kind of gets jettisoned into the earth released down and then it falls um they've create you know set out a uh, landing site in australia where they can go and find the, oh, the, the capsule there's a lot can... of space and no one in it <laughs> exactly yeah they're not worried about hitting anyone there um, but i mean it is it's going to come down through the atmosphere get red red hot 
because you're going at ludicrous speeds in space and then you've got to slow down to basically nothing by the time you get to the ground, or at least it, after you hit the ground. Um, and it's going to hit the ground at, at still very high speed and be roasting hot from coming through the atmosphere. And this thing's going to survive. That's yeah. impressive. But remember, you've got, I mean, the scales are quite, like you've got this enormous, this forty centimeter box, which yeah. is a um, special box, uh, and it's only going to contain you know a few hundred milligrams probably in the end of asteroid. So, so that's quite a lot of shielding. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of shielding. Yeah, so it's going to be looked after. So it's very very exciting. We're expecting that to happen sometime in December twenty twenty. Right. Cool. Very cool. So at this point, we've got a uh, a mission which has got to the asteroid. It's made one sample. It's got another small bullet to fire and then a bloody great bazooka to fire at this asteroid and, and collect some some stuff. It's got little sort of bug type rovers running around on the surface and then it's going to turn around and come back home and throw some stuff at us. Yeah, and this is where I think the whole thing sort of becomes quite poetic as well. So we're returning this little box all the way back to Earth. And um, this comes back to actually what Ryugu is named after. It's named after a Japanese um, folktale story. Mm-hmm. story. Uh, Ryugu means dragon palace. Which See, was... the Japanese are capable of naming space missions in really interesting ways it's and nice, space yeah. things in really interesting What I'm Get back to what Name the rovers. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so Dragon Palace, it's um, this magical underwater palace in the folklore. And we have a fisherman who travels down there with this mysterious box. I don't know the rest of the story, mm. but it does sound kind of nice that we're going to be coming back from Uyugi with a mysterious box that may contain lots of answers to how asteroids work in the early universe. Well, coming out the end of this particular episode, it's been nice and poetic talking about Japanese mythology and collecting samples from asteroids. But unfortunately, we've got to wind it up there. Emily, if people want to contact us here at the show, how can they go about doing that? If someone wanted to send in, for example, a question like we had at the beginning of the show, what can they do? Yeah, well, just like Steve, you can contact us on Twitter. Yes, we indeed. We are at SyzygyPod, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y pod. If you also just bang in SyzygyPod into Facebook, then you'll grab us as well. Well, That's right. I mean, anywhere on the interwebs, we're basically Syzygy Pod. It's, it's always worth a shot, and you'll probably find us. I think we're the only Syzygy Pod. I hope there. so. Yeah, yeah. So we're on the Instagrams and, and all of that as well. Um, of course, we have a website. It's a beautiful website, it I have to say, Chris. It's a lovely website. Thank you very much. It's very, very sweet of you. Syzygy.fm, which is the uh, the URL ending of choice for, for podcasts. Syzygy.fm. You can find all the past episodes there and all the show notes and everything. So go and check us out there and listen to the ones that you haven't caught up on with yet. Um, we would love to to hear from some of you if you want to send in some questions. We devote time to, the, uh, to those on the show and we'll answer them to the best of our ability. So do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoy what we do, then spread the word tell your friends tell your families leave us a review on your podcast catcher of choice and uh and that'll help us to to rise up above the noise and reach as many people as possible because that's our mission here on the syzygy podcast is to spread the love of space and all things astro related around the world otherwise until next time it's a week or so until the next podcast we'll catch up with you then see you later bye bye One A and one B. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm, I'm, I'm riled up about this more I'm than I have been about anything. Because it's, it's no Rover Two. <laughs> Why is it one A and one, not just A and B? Yeah. Surely we could go simpler with this. I hadn't thought about that. You're like you just just one and two or A and B. Surely. Uh, it's it lets you like, know where you're at in the yeah, sequence, right? But then they've got mascot. I mean, that's you know, someone's put some thought into that. Well, that was made by the Germans and the French.